Welcome to this special edition of Daily Vet Life, where we're bringing you short interview synopses of presentations from the 2021 AAEP convention. These special editions are brought to you by Zoetis. I'm Kim Brown, editor of Equimanagement. In this episode, we're talking to Jusila Zobelhusi, and I apologize to her right away because I always mispronounce her name. She's a BBM MS PhD, an associate professor in pathobiology and diagnostic investigation at the Michigan State University College of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Zobelhusi's research focuses on herpes viral diseases. She spoke at the 2021 AAEP convention on equine herpes virus type 1 and EHB1 myeloencephalopathy. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Zobel Jose. Well, thanks for having me. It's a delight to be here and happy to um, talk a little bit about um, my research interests. Well, I, I have talked with you before on podcasts and we've uh, talked to you as a source in articles. And I always learn something. So I'm really looking forward today, especially considering what all has been going on in California and across the country. So can you maybe just start out with what some of the key points were you discussed in your presentation? Yes, sure. So, I mean, my presentation, just generally speaking, you know, I started all out just talking about EHV-1 and, you know, its relevance for clinical practice. And clearly, when we talk about this, what comes to mind is EHM, which is the neurological form of this disease. You know, we know all horses or most horses are latently infected with the virus. It's a very common virus. So really, what we probably should aim for with this virus is to try and prevent the clinical manifestations and with those EHM is what's you know on most people's mind um, you know we've had some major major outbreaks including the one in Ogden and then the one in um, Spain last year where we had 18 deaths and over 200 infected horses all across Europe lots of shutdown of international events but even if you just look at a map of the United States um, you know, you can basically see these cases pop up in every single state throughout the year. So it's a really relevant disease. And at this point, there are vaccines out on the market, but um, they are really only licensed um, for prevention of respiratory disease, maybe a reduction of viral nasal shedding, which does play a role in the epidemiolo epidemiology of the disease. But none of them are labeled for prevention of EHM. And then when we look at the therapeutics, you know, there are some drugs out there, but if you look in the literature, there's very few studies. I mean, Valley Cyclovir does have some value if it started really early in the course of infection, but it's, you know, an expensive treatment, not necessarily always practical or available to all people. There are some um, reports on different anti-inflammatories, but really there isn't that much out there. So what we have in terms of treating horses is super limited. And so what that leaves us with is biosecurity measures. Um, and, you know, I really harp on those because that's really our best bet. It's kind of when we were beginning um, with the, um, you know, COVID-19, um, pandemic um, that's kind of what we were left with in layer of um, treatments and vaccines and that really is very true for EHV and um, you know there's a lot of talk sometimes about the neuropathogenic and the non-neuropathogenic form which in my opinion is a complete misnomer because both forms can cause neurological disease so really whether your horse is infected with one strain of virus or the other what you do is really the same thing which is you know good biosecurity measures. Um, but in any case, what, you know, my research interest is, and I think that most people that study this disease, what they really care about is ultimately trying to find a vaccine and develop a vaccine that would protect horses from EHM as well. And I think what's really hindered us um, in the past is that we just don't have good models to study this disease in. Because in younger horses, we see the disease maybe in, well, we see the neurological form of the disease, I should say, in maybe up to 10% of horses um, that are infected. And that makes a really bad model, really, to test a vaccine, for example. 
Um, and it really also makes it difficult for us to understand what exactly the pathogenesis is, you know, what are risk factors. Now we know that there are some known host and viral risk factors and, the uh, you know, polymerase mutant um, or mutation is one of the viral risk factors, but it's a multifaceted pictures. Now, when we look at the host risk factors, and that's really what my AAP talk fo um, focused on as well, what we do know is that horses that are over 17, 18 years of age and that are female have a much, much increased risk of EHM. So we see rather than the maybe 10% of infected horses showing neurological signs, in older horses, there's a report out there by the um, late Dr. George Allen that says that um, we can see um, EHM in 50 to 70% of infected horses when we um, you know, look at this model. And so what we've done in my laboratory is really taken this model and sort of hypothesized that maybe we can use this model to identify what is different in these horses that makes them more susceptible to EHM. And on the contrary, what type of immune responses or patterns do we observe in horses that are protected from EHM? And so we use this model. We basically um, took, you know, 10 old mares over older than 17 years of age and then 10 young horses and we compared um, them when we infected them with a neuropathogenic strain of EHV1 so that we took that factor out of the equation. And what we found was really very interesting where the young horses all had significant respiratory disease, but only one of them had very mild neurological disease. In contrast with the old horses, we saw no respiratory disease, nothing. We didn't even see the primary fever spike. I mean, it was to the point where we were sort of wondering whether we had accidentally given them saline because we just saw nothing. Part of the world's leading animal health company with a 70-year legacy, Zoetis Equine is committed to providing horse care products and services that veterinarians and their teams can count on. With trusted vaccines such as Corey-Q and Fluvax Innovator, leading diagnostics like the Stable Lab stall side SAA blood test and the number one vet trusted equine sedative, Dermosedan, and a portfolio of regenerative medicine devices that includes ProStride APS, Zoetis is always by your side. Be sure to follow Zoetis Equine on Facebook and Instagram today. And so then though, around, you know, day seven, eight of um, a following infection, these horses, nine of them started showing neurological um, symptoms. And of those nine horses, six of them had severe EHM and had to be euthanized. So that was really a very startling, um, you know, shocking observation. Um, very interesting too. And then when we looked at the virological data, the young horses um, shed a little bit more virus, but both groups shed significant virus. But the old horses or the horses that did have EHM had significantly higher levels of um, viremia, which is, you know, not too unexpected. And so then, though, you know, the main purpose had been to try and identify immunological mechanisms that may be associated with protection or increased risk for EHM. And basically what we found, so we looked very systematically at the different sites of EHV1 replication. So we looked at the respiratory tract, then we looked systemically in the um, blood mononuclear um, lymphocytes, and then we looked at the level of the CNS by collecting um, spinal cord fluid. And so what we really found was that there was a specific pattern that was associated with an increased risk for EHM. And, you know, I understand not everybody is an expert in all the different cytokines and chemokines and whatnot. But basically, to sum this up was what we really found was that the horses that did get EHM they had a reduced interferon response really early on at the respiratory tract. And they had an increased, um, you know, secretion of IL-10 and the sort of more regulatory cytokines. And we believe that that then leads to a priming 
in the local lymphoid tissues that predisposes a horse to get an immune response that is more shaped towards a Th2 um, type of immune response. And with that, what we saw systemically was, again, um, a delayed onset of an interferon response, and in contrast, then an increased um, regulatory and Th2 type of immune response, which was you know, highlighted by IL-10 and TGF-beta, and a reduced induction of um, cytokines that are associated with cytotoxic T lymphocytes, for example, like interferon gamma and Tibet. I mean, this is not something to remember necessarily. And then we looked, you know, down the road in the adaptive immune response, and we saw that the antibody isotype responses that we observed were again consistent with a Th2 type of immune response. So the reason I'm sort of going into this and sort of bringing this up is because I do think the two key points for me are for one, I really think what we've been doing for years and years and years in vaccine development is trying to identify these young, naive horses that haven't been exposed to EHV1 yet, and that's what we do our studies in. But those are not the horses that get EHM, and so maybe we are doing this all wrong, and what we really need to do is we need to look at a horse population that actually gets EHM and is affected by EHM if we want to you know, develop vaccines that protect them from this disease. But the other thing, when you really think about how the immune system works is if we know what happens really early on in the respiratory tract and the type of immune response that's induced there really shapes what immune response we see down the, down the road in the adaptive immune response, maybe what we need to target is that um, you know, respiratory immunity um, early on. And factors that can really affect that would be things like the adjuvants that we use, things that may be stimulating um, an interferon response. You know, what about co-infections or even, you know, vaccines for other viral pathogens like influenza? What about horses that have a really high parasite burden? Those are all things that we might want to think about when we are talking about what's their background um, immune level already. And I think that if we do that and if we use a different model to um, develop our vaccines and test new vaccines, that maybe we'd have better odds um, of actually protecting horses from EHM down the road. And clearly we can also use, you know, therapeutics or immune stimulants to treat horses and, you know, yeah. use the model to do that too. I mean, it's, there's many different possibilities, but I do think that doing all these studies and all this vaccine development in young naive horses is probably not the right path to take. And that's something that where I've really changed my mind because, you know, I've been one of the researchers that has um, been using those young horse models for many years. And I think that that's maybe not what we should be doing. Well, I think you were the very first person when, when we had an interview, gosh, was a year or two ago, that had said that it actually brought to the forefront, you know, if, if you have a barn full of horses, you need to watch out for your older ones, especially your older mares. Right. And it's like, oh, wow, that was, you know, just something that we hadn't keyed into yet. So it's really something to take advantage, you know, to, to talk about. And, and what you're talking about biosecurity, let's and I know that veterinarians understand biosecurity, but let's and we've all been through COVID. So we know the masks, the social distancing, all that. But let's put that into horse terms. <laughs> so for this particular disease, it's a respiratory disease. It right. spreads easily. Yep. So what are our biggest risk factors and how can we use better biosecurity or teach it to our clients? Okay. So, I mean, what you have to keep in mind, yes, it is a respiratory virus and it can be spread via aerosol. But the primary spread really is um, through contact with contaminated uh, nasal secretions. So um, you want to limit the spread through anything that contacts an infected horse. So anything that touches, um, you know, or potentially can carry these secretions, you want to keep separated between infected and uninfected horses. So that means, you know, 
um, tack, feeding materials, cleaning materials, personnel that takes care of horses. Um, ideally, you have personnel taking care of infected and uninfected horses separately. If you can't do that, then at the very minimum, you'd want to change clothing um, and all of that. You'd want to take care of the uninfected horses first. You want to physically separate the horses um, you want to keep people, foot traffic, pets, anything out of the primary biosecurity perimeter. And one that's really, really critical, but it's really hard for owners is to not move exposed horses. So when you are going back to, um, you know, what happened in Spain um, last year, clearly, you know, it was a big event. It, it was crowded, which also is not a great thing. So that, you know, talk about social distancing. There was probably not much social distancing between the horses. But then once there were, you know, first cases, Cases, people started panicking so they literally put their horses on the trailer you know um, and they took them back to their barns so then they spread it all through Europe all through their barns and it does take some discipline you know when you are a panicking owner your horse may not show any signs of infection yet it's important to remember that we see the neurological disease typically maybe a week or 10 days after the initial infection has occurred so even though your horse may not um, show any clinical signs yet, it may already be infected. And so then you're bringing it back, you're not quarantining, um, and that's how the virus spreads. But that's something that's really tough, especially when, um, you know, the show or the race or whatever, the, um, you know, competition isn't set up to, you know, keep horses there longer term and quarantine them. And, you know, I think we also need to have just veterinarians was a better understanding going out there and forcing these things and helping treating the horses and all of that. Um, it's very understandable from an owner's perspective too, that they do panic and they just want to get their horse home, but that's exactly what you shouldn't be doing um, in many ways. But you did mention with the vaccines that there is the thought that a, a horse vaccinated against EHV1 properly vaccinated may have less viral shedding. So that could be helpful. In well, I, mean, I always say on a population basis, if you reduce the overall viral burden, sure, that can be beneficial. But when you are thinking about EHM or in the face of an outbreak, I am not sure that vaccination would be what's first on my mind. Now, you know, if you have a herd of younger horses or, you know, a whole herd of um, mares, even possibly at home, and you know that there's been a horse that's been exposed. Well, for one, I would make sure to not introduce that horse back home for a minimum of three weeks after, you know, the last exposure, basically. But then, you know, you may also just want to make sure everybody at home is um, vaccinated. Sure. I mean, to protect horses that haven't been exposed yet, but, you know, to vaccinate in the face of an infection with the goal to protect your horse that's there already from EHM, that probably is not, um, you know, meeting the goal that you would want to meet there. Yeah, I, I was talking about ahead of time so that it's kind of helped anything that will help stimulate the horse's immune system, as you said, because you, you talk a lot about it's um, virus related as well as host related. Yeah. It's, it's dosage of the virus that they get. And your biosecurity is how you can reduce that to a great extent, correct? I mean, right. yeah, all of those things matter. And clearly, you know, if you have a good immune response, maybe your odds are better. I mean, again, I think one of the problem that we are having is that for one, we don't actually really know how well the current vaccines that are available could potentially work in older horses, for example. Yeah. Um, so that's a problem. But, you know, we may also not have the right type of vaccines to protect from EHM because what protects from respiratory disease may not work um, as well from EHM. So we, we are really sort of, you know, th there's a big black box that we are not completely understanding yet. And so that's, I think, where I'm sometimes hesitant to recommend vaccination or not recommend vaccination um, is because I just don't know at this point how beneficial the vaccines really are going to be to prevent EHM. 
we don't know that answer yet. But on the respiratory form, there are good studies yeah. that have shown it does protect. And I'm, right. I'm looking forward to some of your future uh, studies that show how maybe if we can stop it in that respiratory, the first early stages or do something different right. in that stage that it won't progress. Right. I mean, because ultimately, I mean, and I know that there are some studies out there from Cornell and there the idea is to, you know, if you can just prevent viremia altogether, then clearly we won't be seeing EHM. And I do agree with that very much. I mean, if you can stop it in its track, tracks and prevent viremia, you're not going to see EHM. So that is a good goal. But I also think it's not just preventing viremia. It really is the type of immune response that you see early on at the respiratory tract because that really modulates everything that's induced downstream. So it's not just how much virus there is or not. You know, even if you could neutralize all the virus, I think the type of immune response that you are inducing and that's there to stay really um, makes a big difference as well. Well, as usual, I have learned a lot yet again. And thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Sobelhasi. And a big thanks to Zoetis for sponsoring this podcast. So there's going to be a series of 12 of these special editions of the Daily Vet Life podcast on your favorite podcast network, or you can visit equimanagement.com to listen to all of them. And make sure and go back and check them out. But we really appreciate you joining us today. And I hope to hear from you soon about some of your research on the older horses and, and maybe some of this early protection. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much. 